Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this year's Cheshire Development Update. I'm Sarah Townsend, editor of Place Northwest. I hope you've enjoyed some networking in the other room before we start. Please do continue to join in with today's event. You can ask questions of our panelists, you can private message other delegates, and you can make the most of the virtual networking by clicking on the different tables and joining the chat. I'd like to thank our sponsors today, Campbell Reith and Taurus. We've got almost 100 registered guests and an expert lineup of presenters and panelists for you. So it'd be a great opportunity to get under the skin of what's going on in Cheshire. This event is split into two halves with a networking break in between. The first half will have a presentation followed by a panel, and then the second half will, will have one slightly extended panel session. There will also be half an hour's networking at the end, so you can continue making connections and doing business. By now, I'm sure many of you have attended our Remo events before. We're, we're rapidly getting to the end of the year, unbelievably. But for those of you less familiar with the platform, the networking opportunity is really the big difference when compared to other platforms such as Zoom. It's useful to create your own profile so that when someone clicks on you, they can see straight away who you are. And do join tables as well in the main room and video chat with other guests. All you have to do is double click on a particular table and you'll be taken straight there. There's also messaging in the chat function and of course the Q&A function where you can direct questions to our panelists that will weave into our discussion. We've included a short video guide to getting the most out of Remo, which you can find at the top of your screens to the left of the speaker's green room. Please do let us know your feedback though, because we're always looking to improve. So on to today's agenda. Cheshire, it's got some of the region's most successful and thriving science and technology parks, low carbon clusters, quality housing developments, both big and small, plenty of green space and some beautiful historic cities. What's not to like? Cheshire is also one of the fastest growing economies in the UK. But of course, like so many other parts of the region and country, it has had to get to grips with the disruptions of 2020 and how its future plans may be impacted. So this event will explore the development opportunities in Cheshire and the ambitions, policies and plans shaping them. So let's kick off. To start with, Philip Cox, Chief Executive of the Cheshire and Warrington Local Enterprise Partnership, will present an update on some of the key projects the LEP is backing at the moment, which have transformative potential for the subregion. Over to you, Philip. Hi, good morning. Hello, Philip. Hi. Hi. Mic off, but good morning, everyone. Absolutely delighted to uh, to be here, and um, what perfect timing, given that we've had the uh, the sort of the the, the, the spending of you yesterday, and the Chancellor talking about uh, sort of the worst the worst economic recession in 300, uh, 300 years, um, which makes what I'm going to say over the next 15 minutes sound a bit odd because I'm going to talk about an economy that actually um, is continuing to thrive and has got many opportunities to uh, thrive. So I've got a few slides here, which um, let's see if we can uh, get them uh, get them up on the up on the screen. Uh, um, hopefully, uh, hopefully everybody can see uh, see that, including the stuff that's also coming across my screen and my emails keep keep coming in. Um, and I, so what I want to do over the next uh, ten to fifteen minutes or so is just talk to you about some of the things that the LEP is investing in, uh, some of the other things that are happening in the uh, happening in the area. And let me start with the Cheshire Science Corridor. So, Sarah talked about um, Cheshire being a sort of a genuine hotbed of of science and uh, technology. Um, we've got incredibly high uh, investment in R&D by sort of the, the private sector in this uh, in this area. And what you see on your screen there is the Cheshire Science Corridor. Um, many sites in there have got enterprise zone status and had it now for uh, uh, for about the past and getting on nearly five, five years. We have seen 97 new businesses uh, set, set themselves up on the sites across the uh, Science Corridor, nearly two and a half thousand new jobs, 800,000 square feet of new commercial floor space, and 11 million pounds of direct uh, investment from the, uh, the Local Enterprise Partnership. But that then generating 146 million pounds of private sector uh, investment. And some of the things that we've been investing in, um, the Audley Park uh, Glasshouse, 150,000 
square feet. Um, let's put nearly £4 million into uh, that against a total scheme cost of £26 million. Um, already 27 customers in there employing 300 to 300 staff, 90% 90 let. Uh, Audi Park blocks 22 to 24. Uh, that is uh, the next development that we will be uh, that we'll be funding. Four million pounds going into that as well from the uh, from the from the lab. Also funding a two thousand two hundred space multi story car park as part of that. Recognising that uh, notwithstanding um, everything that we want to do as a lab to sort of make uh, Cheshire and Warrington as sustainable an economy as possible, Audley Park is realistically relatively remote and therefore heavily dependent certainly at the moment on the private uh, on the private uh, on the private car. So kind of so blocks twenty two to twenty four. Um, uh, are part of a sort of a, a wider uh, a wider program of investment at Audley Park, which includes um, not particularly elegantly titled Validation Centre of Excellence. What that basically means is that we are putting five million pounds through the Get Building Fund into one of the most biosecure labs in the uh, in the country. That's going to be a sort of a hugely uh, sort of a huge benefit to the area and is already attracting sort of many more life science companies wanting to come and take advantage of the facilities are there and the sort of the research that will take place once it's uh, once it's uh, once it's set up um moving away from Audley park um birchwood park um another direct investment by the uh by the local enterprise partnership uh this in this case just over six hundred thousand pounds so far but the potential to take that investment up to three million pounds, uh, um, depending on the needs of the uh, needs of the occupier, um, 170,000 square feet of new industrial space at, uh, at Birchwood. That's also been uh, also been completed in discussions with uh, with with Birchwood Park and with Warrington Borough Council about the next uh, the next phase. Talking about next phases, Ellesmere Port. Uh, this has been hugely hugely successful. Um, those of you who've been in Cheshire and Warrington a long time will be aware of Hooton Park. Hooton Park used to be part of the Vauxhall estate, um, was bought by the um, by the public sector, I think originally by English partnerships, then it transferred over to the Regional Development Agency, then it transferred back to the Homes and Communities Agency, um, and just sort of reflecting on sort of the uh, number of transfers between public sector agencies that took place, you will get an impression of just how difficult uh, those agencies were finding to get to get it away. Came into the enterprise zone, we've made gap funding uh, available in this instance, 1.7 million pounds for the first phase, um, immediately taken on by uh, private sector developer Red Sun. Um, it has already been sold on, to uh, another property company and has been let to a firm called Survitec who are moving out of Birkenhead, but moving out of Birkenhead because they want to expand and they need the expansion space. Survitec, if you don't know them, really, really high tech business. Um, amongst other things, they produce the flying chutes that are used by uh, uh, jet fighter pilots uh, who are flying the new American F-35, which is also the, uh, the UK sort of uh, typhoon uh, aircraft. Uh, so a real a real catch for Cheshire and Warrington, and as a consequence of, uh, of that, um, we're now in active discussion with uh, with Red Sun about Aviator Phase Two as well. Um, sort of a huge transformation of that uh, of that area uh, as it became a uh, an enterprise uh, enterprise zone. <clears throat> Similarly, elsewhere in Ellesmere Port, we have the Helix uh, Helix Business uh, Business Park that was completed last uh, last October. It is now uh, now fully let. Um, Rhino Products also um, completed in uh, uh, late 2019. 20, um, uh, and, and you know, and one of the features about uh, Ellesmere, Ellesmere Port and the uh, the, the New Bridge uh, area of industrial estate um, is that sort of we took a pretty down at heel uh, industrial area, um, gave it enterprise zone status. Uh, we have now got one site left in there to get away, um, which is Newport Road. There are active discussions uh, ongoing between uh, the uh, Cheshire West Council and a prospective uh, prospective purchaser, um, and then we'll be looking to sort of put further investment into uh, into that site as well. Coming out of the enterprise zone, um, 
be absolutely wrong with me not to mention uh, Chester, Chester Northgate. Um, in further investment, this was originally uh, sort of uh, facilitated by the investment that the LEP put into the bus station that enabled the sort of the creation of a new bus station, the moving of sort of the uh, previous uh, the previous bus uh, bus stands, opening up the area for um, uh, that area of Chester for, uh, for for development. We have put further money into this uh, into this development, in particular into the uh, into sort of helping with the cost of the uh, cost of the drainage, um, and that's really really crucial. The because what we have done is we've been able to sort of we've enabled that 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 drainage that was going in anyway for uh, for Northgate to be expanded, so that um, to sort of create a situation where there's probably about another sort of thirty to forty years of development capacity still available in Chester before we put sort of further pressure on the uh, on the main on the main drainage. So kind of op opening up opportunities not so much for Chester Northgate. But actually, the wider uh, the wider area in uh, in, in in Chester. Um, another get building fund uh, uh, program that we've been uh, we've been funding. Um, Warrington are keen to sort of become the first town in Britain to offer all electric uh, all electric buses. Um, and what you see there, sort of. Um, uh, so sort of, uh, I suspect actually looking looking at the picture, I think it's probably I think it is in fact Aldringham uh, Aldringham Station, but sort of looking to create sort of uh, a new bus garage in uh, in Warrington. It will have facilities that will allow um, charging not only of Chess uh, Warrington's own buses, but also sort of electric taxis and other buses that sort of come into the uh, come into the station. The key point about this, as well as potentially putting Warrington absolutely the vanguard of, um, kind of, uh, of making the UK sort of a sort of a, a, a green sort of a, a, an extremely green economy and a, an economy that's sort of uh, heavily uh, making heavy use of uh, sustainable public transport. The other point about this is that it also opens up uh, by moving the existing bus station it also opens up bank key gateway as well as a sort of a further opportunity for uh, for, for development. And then finally, uh, or almost finally, um, sort of um, more than I'm just going to describe these as glints in our eye, but I think they are more than glints in our eye. So I started by describing the Cheshire Science Corridor going to sort of east to west across the uh, across the across the area. We also have a proposal that we are actively discussing with government at the moment about a north south growth corridor, starting in Crewe. Uh, bringing that corridor largely parallel to the um, to the new HS2 line and exploiting the growth opportunities that HS2 will uh, will offer us um, and looking to sort of promote uh, kind of development, uh, particularly in crew in crew towns set in around the station, which will be sort of office development. Although I'm conscious that we need to be sort of uh, we'll probably take that office development a little bit slower at the moment until we sort of see how the office market settles down post, post COVID. Much more confident about industrial developments are looking to uh, um, promote and further um, uh, industrial development uh, in the Basford area. And then coming up with sites in Winsford, Middlewich, housing sites in, uh, in, uh, in Northwich, um, and then up into, uh, up into, up into Warrington. So it says potential sort of six housing pathfinder schemes in there. Um, two towns funds in the kind of crew in Warrington, both benefiting from uh, from towns fund, and the and the conversation that we are having with uh, central government is about uh, whether we can use the the TIF funding model, the tax increment finance uh, financing model, the TIF model that has been so so successful in our in the science corridor uh, enterprise zone. Now that's a live conversation, quite literally at the moment. Um, we are making the point to the government that if they were to approve it tomorrow, which let's be realistic, they're not going to, um, but if, it, if they were able to approve it tomorrow, then initial discussions that we've had with, uh, with potential developers could see bulldozers on site by the middle of, uh, the middle of next year. So there the really is stuff ready to go in that, uh, in that area. So we are, we are trying to sort of push on um, to encourage uh, ministers to uh, Pursue, pursue that uh, proposal. Some of the benefits um, from that, uh, six million 
square feet new commercial floor space, 30,000 uh, new homes, nearly 9,000 new jobs, and an additional two billion pounds of, uh, of, of, of GVA. And then very, very finally, because I think it would be a mistake um, not to talk about uh, housing. Um, uh, we again are in active discussion with the uh, with Homes England about um, promoting some what we are describing as housing housing pathfinders um, develop, being developed through the sub regional uh, housing board. We have a a, a pipeline of five hundred and thirty seven residential sites sort of in that in the housing pipeline at varying stages of uh, various stages of uh, development. Um, all of those being either within the science corridor or within the uh, high speed growth growth corridor. The key point for the local enterprise partnership is that um, kind of Cheshire and Warrington struggles to attract and retain young people. And one of the features of those young people is that um, people aged under 29, only 60%, that's six zero, um, have a driving license. So 40% of under 29 year olds do not have a driving license. They therefore need to use public transport to get to work. Um, they need to be located quite close to where that work where that work is. Um, what they can't um, what they can't do is that they're unable to live in sort of uh, outlying villages and so on and so forth. So we are working with the Homes England and with the local authorities to actively promote sort of housing sites in in urban areas housing sites that would be suitable for sort of uh, for under th for people aged under 30 under 35 now again um, the pandemic may well have sort of changed things if anything the pandemic is probably going to result in more people sort of uh, coming out of big cities actually more people you know particularly if we're attracting people up from uh, you know central Manchester center Liverpool uh, center of London an even greater proportion of those will be unable to drive. Um, they will want the more attractive uh, and smaller town locations that we that we offer, but they will need to be sort of in uh, in urban areas. But a, but a, you know an interesting discussion we're having with Homes England over that, alongside sort of a really really strong sort of uh, sort of pipeline. So I think that takes up sort of all the time that I've got, but it also covers everything that I wanted to cover. I hope what that uh, what that what that shows you is a um, kind of a, uh, uh, it's a uh, let me just come out of that. Uh, I hope what that shows you is a really, really strong pipeline of development, notwithstanding what the, uh, what the Chancellor, was, uh, Chancellor was saying yesterday about just how difficult economic conditions uh, are. I think sort of there's, there's some real sort of real encouragement, real optimism, I think, sort of certainly scope for optimism in, uh, in Cheshire and Warrington. I was noticing that, uh, that the Office of Budget Responsibilities kind of upside upside forecast yesterday, um, which assumes that a vaccine will be available for the virus in the new year, has the GDP being back up to its pre-pandemic levels by the end of uh, by the end of the next calendar year. Um, let's hope that that vaccine does come through. Let's hope that we uh, that we do sort of uh, get that benign sort of uh, bounce back. Um, I think sort of Cheshire and Warrington is well placed to, to take full advantage of that. So thanks so much indeed, Sarah. Thanks, Philip. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. There's clearly a lot of very exciting stuff going on and, and that was a really useful introduction to our first panel discussion, I think. Um, so we're going to be discussing now the outlook for development in Cheshire in more detail and how the county could be a growth driver for the region's economy, um, particularly in the wake of the pandemic. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Jamie Bottomley, Head of Commercial at Alderley Park Science and Technology Hub, Jane Hennessy, Development Manager at Peel Environmental, part of the developer Peel LMP, Nicola Rigby, Principal at Averson Young, and Philip Cox of the Cheshire and Warrington LEP. If our speakers could activate their cameras and mics, please, if they haven't done so already. And to our audience, I see there's a couple of questions already there, which is fantastic. So please do keep on submitting any questions through this Q&A button and we'll sort of weave them into our conversation and hope to get through as many as possible in, uh, in the next 45 minutes or so. So welcome to our, to our panel. Good morning. 
Um, so as Philip has outlined, there's a lot going on in Cheshire right now. And I thought it'd be quite helpful for our panelists to introduce them and to give a brief overview of the projects they're working on in Cheshire right now. So we've got a great mix of speakers representing housing, science and tech, the low carbon economy, planning. Um, Jamie, perhaps you'd like to kick us off. What's going on at Alderley Park? Yeah, certainly. So I'm Jamie Bossy. I'm the head of commercial at Alderley Park, working for Bruntwood SciTech. Um, I think probably the main change we've seen in the last six to 12 months is a, a shift in the, the demand balance um, away from offices towards labs, laboratory stock and, and life science demand um, in particular. We've seen uh, COVID specific demand for labs, i.e. The Lighthouse Lab primarily, but also companies that have uh, taken on short term contracts to service um, COVID related demand. But I think something that is is more fundamentally positive is that the, the non COVID specific demand has also increased quite substantially. So that's that's risen by sort of 30 to 40 percent since April this year, um, which is great. Um, my one of my main projects and the projects for the site is delivering the stock that that Philip spoke about earlier. So um, numbers 22 to 24 Mearside labs based um, along with some other labs on site will we'll be bringing forward 125,000 square foot cross site. Um, and we're accelerating that delivery because of the confidence we see we've got in, in the demand we're seeing and that demand is underpinned by um, peaks, their uh, new highs and levels of investment in life sciences generally. So that's that's our first main priority. And then the second is that we, as Philip spoke about, we opened Glasshouse, um, which is aimed at broader technology, build, uh, broader technology companies, an office building. Um, the serviced offices are 90 percent let. There is still about 100,000 square foot of vacant space um, within the building. But our, I think our main priority over the next 12 months is that um, we launched it in February. Lockdown happened in March, so we've had quite a, a disjointed start within the building. And the reason for opening the building is to in integrate technology into the life science sector there, and integrate the two the two sectors as because we'll see technology disrupt life sciences as we see it disrupt everything else. Um, and our efforts to do that have been a bit disrupted, to be honest, over the last eight months or so. So our priority over the next twelve is to really accelerate that as as we get more people back into sight again. Absolutely. OK, thanks, Jamie. Um, your audio is very clear. It's quite quiet, though. So perhaps maybe if there's some sort of um, adjustment you can do with the, with the microphone. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. Thanks for that. Um, what about you, Jane? Peel Environmental is, is also very busy at the moment um, with various schemes, either in planning or being built, for example, at the Protoss Energy Park. Yes. Um, and I understand a broader master plan has just been published for that, actually, even though a few schemes have already kind of got underway there. Perhaps you can give us a bit of an update on, on the newest elements of, of what you're working on. OK, so good morning. I'm Jane Hennessy from Peel Environmental. But we watch, spoiler alert, are rebranding as of the 2nd of December to Peel Natural Resources and Energy. So we are part of the wider Peel group. Peel Natural Resources and Energy is involved with mining, um, renewables, um, obviously Protoss, so wind farms, um, electric vehicle charging, there's a, a multi-faceted. Multi, um, so in regard to Protoss, which for those of you that don't know about Protoss, it is a, an energy park which demonstrates clustering. So. Um, phase one was completed in December 2016. That put a, a new road into reductible standards, water, um, a 54 hectare ecology area, which is managed by Cheshire Wildlife Trust for us. Um, phase two is about to start imminently. So that will start hopefully before Christmas and that will put the remainder of the roads in to open up phase two. It will, um, increase the capacity of the water supply it will build out further ecological areas and this is anchored by the energy from waste facility which is Cavanta's energy from waste facility there was no power in the area at the biomass which is operational 
the BIG biomass um, took the last bit of power in the area. So with Scottish Power Energy Networks, we are building two new substations, which will enable 124 megawatts of export, so generation export. So that will enable large energy users to come to the site and co-locate cluster next to energy generation. So we were also exploring local grid elements of that. So Protoss might be self-sufficient in that um, a large energy user, it would attract <clears throat> or keep energy users in the area. And given the announcement of the 10 point plan that fits nicely into that, into regard to keeping industry and attracting industry to Cheshire. I'm trying to think of anything else that's happened. Oh, you mentioned the, the plastic park. So we are, there was a press release a couple of weeks ago. The, the level, as Jamie said, the level of inquiries has not stopped despite COVID, which is great. And we've been massively busy. A lot of the inquiries that are coming through are plastic inquiries. So they've ranged from We've got plot 10B, which is plastic to hydrogen, so that's powerhouse energy. We've got um, Enviru, who have submitted their planning application this Friday gone. So they will take PET, which is all your Coke, Sprite bottles, and it's circular. It will turn them back into food grade PET. So that is a, I think that's a good example of what people on the ground can relate to, that their Coke bottle goes back into another Coke bottle and, and then it answers corporate social responsibility in regard to the companies that are, are selling these products. And there's a number of other um, chemical and mechanical recyclers that are in touch in regard to the rest of the park. So that should go in for planning in, in the next month. So. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good overview. And um, clearly a lot of these things are, uh, you know, have a, have a very wide national interest, don't they? So that's really interesting. Um, OK, Nicola, um, Averson had two big planning consents awarded this week in crew, didn't it, for a thousand odd homes or something? Said, yeah. yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit about those projects and, and also what else you're working on in Cheshire? Yeah, absolutely. Um, morning, everybody. Nicola Rigby, Principal Averson Young. Um, I lead the regeneration offer in the northwest of England. Uh, and as Sarah says, has got a team um, sort of sat around me and, and behind me that do um, quite a significant number of planning applications, in particular across the Cheshire um, Cheshire area. So you're right, Sarah, um, this week's been a great week in terms of getting some planning decisions through much needed housing delivery um, within the crew area. Um, which I think is sort of well reported and Philip's already alluded to within uh, within his presentation at the start. Uh, more widely in terms of things that we're involved in um, with an eye on crew, Basford is, is an important development area for us. Um, uh, you know, Jamie's already talked about Aldley Park. We're very heavily involved in Aldley Park from a planning application perspective and obviously from an uh, industrial uh, industrial market perspective, our agents are incredibly active across the whole of Cheshire, Warrington subregion, and actually busier now than, than we ever have been in terms of activity on the ground. I think um, from a planning application perspective, it's fair to say that, that things haven't stopped over the last um, eight, nine months. I think planning applications and, and project discussions that we had live before COVID started remain as critically important now as ever, and we've continued to try to move them forwards. And I think we've got a few more coming up that we hope to get positive decisions on in the coming weeks. Fantastic. Thanks, Nicola. Um, OK, uh, Philip, uh, you sort of already introduced yourself in your presentation. Um, but there's actually I have got another question for you, but um, there is actually a question from the audience that I thought it might be. It might be a good time just to direct that one to you right now, actually, if that's OK. Um, this is from Jane Harrod Roberts. What major activities are you undertaking? to promote Cheshire and Warrington to a UK-wide and international audience during 2021. Do you think you could fill us in on that? I can, and that's a, it's a really good question. And I would describe it as a uh, work, in, work in progress. Um, Jane sort of, sort of, uh, <coughs> sort of joined us uh, very regularly uh, at our trips to MIPIM, um, sort of MIPIM Property Festival down in, the, down in the south of France, which was a really, really good sort of vehicle for sort of getting our message out 
internationally, but also, you know, intriguingly, actually, uh, domestically as well. Um, so it'd be far easier to sort of get the local press to uh, feature stuff that we were doing if we told them that we were sort of talking about it on a, on a platform in the south of France, and it would, that it would be, I'm afraid, on a platform in Oakley Park or something. But, um, but um, sort of, uh, but... But, but kind of, I mean, Mipium hasn't happened this year. And although they're talking about doing it next June, I suspect that sort of uh, it may not happen again. But and even if it does, I think it's going to be a sort of a, a pale shadow of its former self, at least for a, for a period. But the reason why this is such a good question is that um, I think that the Cheshire Warrington economy is moving into a sort of a different, a different phase, a different, a different, you know, notwithstanding my confidence, uh, in the future of the economy, um, we are moving out from being a place where we've, we we actually had more jobs than we had people in the uh, certainly people of working age in the uh, in the sub region, and that meant actually in truth and actually those the numbers of jobs was was was, was increasing faster than the population was increasing. So we didn't actually need to do an awful lot to sort of uh, attract attract people into the uh, into the area. It's one of the reasons why you know for example you know Nicola can sort of with confidence you know get a uh, you know, planning permission for another thousand homes in Crewe for example. Um, we are getting, you know the Charles is talking about you know unemployment. You know, it's now up at about five percent. He's talking about it going up to nearly, uh, nearly, nearly ten percent in the middle of uh, in the middle of next year. We're not going to be immune from that. Therefore, we we will need to be in a world in which we'll need to be actively promoting Cheshire and Warrington as a great place to sort of you know live, work, and invest. So we're thinking very, very hard about how we get that message out domestically, but also internationally. Focusing on the areas where we're really, really strong. Um, you know, uh, life sciences. Uh, green energy, you know, and, you know, it's great that you've got both Jamie and, uh, and Jane on the panel today because I think that the, those are the, you know, they represent sort of our, our two sort of uh, real, real strengths. Actually, logistics, um, financial services as, uh, as, 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 as well. Um, so we're just thinking through how best to do that. Um, there are one or two things in the offing which, um, and there's likely to be some funding available to actually help companies themselves. Sort of actively, uh, actively market uh, market themselves for sort of both for in investment, but also for export export opportunities. And looking at sort of working really, really closely with the with the local authorities around that. So um, uh, I'm conscious that you know probably Jane was looking for some specifics, but um, what I, I haven't quite got those yet, partly because actually we're not quite sure when we can restart so certainly the the physical visits um but it's something we're thinking very very hard about at the uh at the moment and we will be we will be doing an awful lot of active active projection of uh cheshire and warrington as i said that great place to uh, great place to invest as we as we get into 2021 okay thanks philip just uh, one question from me then to you um as well which is um which is just a bit more drilling down to the impact of covid actually um and I'm wondering about just sort of changing employment trends, because you mentioned before this event that the LEP has recorded higher job creation rates in Cheshire than the rest of the country. And I wonder if that's held up during the pandemic and, and you know, how is this likely to play out over the coming year? Um, it's difficult to say what's happened. The, the, the sort of the, one of the problems with economic data is it tends to sort of heavily, heavily lag. So um, what, what we're working on is an awful lot of, uh, awful lot of anecdote. What we do know is that unemployment has not increased by nearly as much as we feared it was going to do uh, when we came into the coming into the pandemic. Um, and we also, I think, know a couple of other things. Um, the people who've been hardest hit are the young. Um, so um, we're working quite hard to kind of uh, make it as easy as possible for them to get back into work. You know, the, the, the government's kickstart scheme um, is a good vehicle for at least getting people placements and back into that world of work. We're doing uh, a lot to run online uh, online job fairs, uh, for example. Um, and, and, and what's interesting about those job fairs is, you know, we're getting several thousand participants when we run those things, but we're also getting a large number of large number of jobs being offered through those. So, so it's not that there are no jobs out there. That, that's that's definitely not the uh, definitely not the case. Is an issue potentially about sort of the skills match between the sort of the people who are uh, becoming unemployed. And the type of jobs that we need we've got the accelerate program we've got various other programs that are um, have the potential to provide people with retraining um the, the sort of i think the sort of the other main group <coughs> that we are well two other main groups that we're worried about 
Worried about people with sort of complex needs. That's an ongoing. That's an ongoing issue. Um, I think sort of life has become harder for them. So we're working quite hard with, with that group. But then the other really really interesting group are people who are becoming unemployed, and either because they've got a partner that's working, therefore there's not much benefit to them in sort of you know signing on as as unemployed, that, um, or you know they're in their mid 50s and the redundancy package was okay and they weren't really looking to retire but they're probably assuming that there are no jobs out there so they're not bothering to not bothering to look so we want to get in touch with those people uh and again trying to think through how best to do that and get the message out there that to come on to those job fairs let us give you help with uh preparing your cv if you haven't done that for uh, for the last 20 years uh i'm really sort of focusing in on on them at the at the moment there's still a lot of people furloughed and we will have to see how that furloughing uh plays out the only other thing i would say is we do need to be prepared for a change in in kind of the balance of balance of employment you know it's very very interesting the total retail sales in the uk are now well above where they were at the beginning of the year but an awful lot of that has gone online and the reality is that many firms, many retail firms will have discovered that they can do very good trade online. Many other people have got used to buying things online. We need to face up to the fact that some of the retail, some of the sort of the face-to-face -face retail, the high street retail is going to, is going to decline. Um, and um, we are going to need to think about uh some repurposing of uh of 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 well some town centers because again the thing that's happened is that people are being more inclined to shop local northwich which had struggled um is doing very very well during the pandemic chester but there are particular things about chester uh um and its proximity to wales during the lockdown but chester has Chester has suffered um over the last few weeks but uh in the last few months so there, there's, there's a lot going on but I think some of that is long-term changes in the structure of the UK economy. We're going to need to be ready to uh, to address uh, to address that as well. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Philip. Um, Jamie, then, with uh, you know, given your experience, how would you say um, you know the private sector and the, and the public sector can work together to sort of better tie up property development with job creation and particularly job creation in these high growth industries? Um, and you know and also linking that up with sort of changing occupier trends that, that we've spoken of as well this sort of un uncertainty around offices and and, and on retail etc yeah so i think there's i think in sort of knowledge intensive industries like life sciences and, and i suspect energy as well then um partnerships between landlords commercial organizations academia public sector bodies and, and others as well are really important to I think to sort of accelerate the the growth um within those sectors and to develop those clusters where you can get a far deeper sort of niche niche functions within them um I think as developers uh, we we need to make sure that we um respond quickly to changes in the market um so within life sciences for example we've seen the big pharma companies consolidating uh, significantly and outsourcing their R&D to, to smaller businesses. So we're making sure we put in place services like sort of access to capital intensive equipment, um, access to business support that are specifically designed to support those SMEs and, and fuel their growth quicker. Um, I think sort of from a, a sort of council perspective, it's, it's addressing the gaps that maybe commercial organisations aren't prepared to, to fill or, or don't fill to an adequate level or to sort of the optimum level is probably a better way of putting it so that could be around skills it could be around transport um and within sort of labs and life sciences in particular the, the cost of infrastructure development cost to build a lab can be uh, pretty high so the validation center of excellence for example is a a particularly um high grade laboratory that comes with particularly high uh, infrastructure costs so that that partnership um helps to unlock uh, a development that might otherwise be unviable um as well as um generating those jobs in in a, in a high skill area yeah 
Okay, that's interesting. While we're on a sort of funding, um, uh, you know, strand, um, Jane, I, I wonder what your view is on the levelling up fund that was announced yesterday. Admittedly, the details are a little bit sort of slim at the moment, but um, do you see some opportunity for, you know, some of the projects at Protoss, for example, to be to be sort of, you know, part funded through that or are they all pretty well funded by the private sector? No, we've already used um, funds from the Green Investment Fund to build the phase one works. Um, we have a loan via CBRE, which is um, a pension fund that has um, lent us the money to build out the grid works. So I think as well from um, maybe not answering your question in, in exactly how you've asked it, but um, going back to, to what you asked Philip and what you asked Jamie, the promoting Cheshire and and what is here already, there's so much to go at, especially with the 10 point plan and it's mentioned green finance is one of the things. So we should, I think Cheshire should be grabbing that because it's it's a sleep, Philip will probably kill me for saying this, it's a sleeping giant. It, it's it's already doing so many of these things that are already on this 10 point plan and it, they just need to be grabbed. It's ideally placed for, for hydrogen. So all these, um, I know they're not necessarily the same jobs for people who might have lost the jobs, but the council have got something in place for their disaster recovery recovery plan in retraining people there's also um the work zone that they have which would help um train people or get them ready for interviews for the likes of occupiers that might come on to protoss um we've got the cheshire energy hub and the Eni energy innovation district so there's all these things that the government have mentioned yesterday whereas keeping keeping industry in the area a lot of parties like NSERC and CF they've already been looking to decarbonize so I think we're in a really good place in regard to we just need to grab that green finance now yeah. um, and then there's another study for the whole of the area which is called ePort that looks at a, a multi-vector energy solution it's looked at residential industry and how it all fits together so that was a competition run by um innovate uk we're in phase two of that now so i think we're ahead of the curve brilliant okay thanks jane um i'd like to um move on ask nicola a bit about the residential sector specifically but just before we do that i'm aware there's uh two questions both about northgate actually um, on here from our audience. Um, just to say as well, a heads up, we will probably be talking about Northgate in, in, in a bit of detail in the second panel, um, because we've got representative from the local council um, speaking there. Um, but before we sort of move on and, and change tack in our discussion, would any of the panel like to comment on either of these two questions? What would you like to see from Northgate? And also, should Northgate 2 be offered openly on a UK wide basis as a strategic Northwest development site rather than be controlled by the local council. Um, and I should say um, here, maybe to our coordinators working in the background, maybe we should leave those questions open so that we can revisit them in the second panel as well. Um, would anyone like uh, to? Uh, should I jump in first and, and um, sure. others might have other views? Northgate's got to be one of the most contentious three generation uh, projects in the northwest of England, I would have thought. Um, it's, it's such a great opportunity for investment. Um, you know, Philip's just alluded to some of the issues um, that Chester has faced most recently, but Northgate's a long-standing regeneration priority, um, which which does have uh, regional significance in that context, I think. Um, I think it's really interesting to talk about any um, town and city centre regeneration project at the moment. You know, we've been involved in in a number for a long time that are having to, to rethink strategy. So uh, I, I think it's it's always a, you know it's a good time now to be talking about um, looking to the future at Northgate, and I think clearly um, Northgate too has got to be all about diversification and the long term sustainability of of the centre. So it's you know the, it's got to be very heavily focused on um, an experience, high quality of development, attracting footfall. Um, just with one nod, Sarah, to potentially a follow-up question, residential development is going to be absolutely fundamental within our centres going forward. And I think we would argue um, that we've got to be really innovative and clever about residential development in centres as well, you know, increasingly thinking about um, 
finally cracking the nut of intergenerational living within our core areas, um, you know, mixing tenures, mixing household types to create genuinely sustainable um, communities within those locations. I think the, the second question, um, yeah, I mean, the, the role of the council is absolutely fundamental in delivering Northgate, always has been, always will be, and, and as it should be within a, a major city centre development project. Um, but but the opportunity to invest, I think, is is that it, you know, marketing of it and raising its prominence outside of a local context is going to be really important to, to its success in the future. I think the, the subtext of control by the council, um, I think there's a really important role for the council, but I don't think we should overplay that as a controlling role. It, it's everybody should be interested in bringing development forwards uh, within such an important development location. Brilliant. Thanks, Nicola. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? Probably be a mistake if I didn't. Uh, if I didn't, I mean, I, I kind of I, I agree with an awful lot of what Nicola Nicola said, uh, and it goes back to what I was saying about you know what is going to happen to town centres as a consequence of the uh, consequence of the pandemic, um, and I think actually you know as Nicola was saying, I think you know actually an important role for the council here because um, place place shaping and place making is going to be increasingly uh, increasingly important um you do need you know a public sector body uh, in, in this instance i think you know quite rightly the uh, the local authority to be sort of taking taking that role and sort of trying to you know, create the chester that um that will work in a sort of a post-pandemic uh, post-pandemic environment and i think that's uh, that's going to be really really important you know creating actually this you know if necessary the type of retail space that will uh, that will work for the future. You know, Nicola talked about, and I mentioned in my presentation, about the importance of uh, bringing more people to live in town centres. That was important sort of pre-pandemic. I think it's likely to be even more important post-pandemic in sort of uh, in places like uh, like like Chester. So I think sort of, uh, I, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, probably what's important is that, you know, without well, I talk about sort of you know the, the being a little bit flexible to sort of respond to the market and to respond to the changes, but without doing so in such a way that delays you know it's you know it takes a long time to sort of you know change it, change the development. The last thing we want is phase one done and then another ten year delay before phase two comes uh, comes along. So there's a balance to be struck between sort of uh, you know responding to the changes caused by COVID and. And, and, and not getting on with uh, not getting on with the, with the development. So I think as long as the, the, the local authority gets those right, then I think we'll, we should be sure to set fair for sort of uh, for a good outcome in Northgate. Mm, great. Okay. Thanks so much, both of you. Um, Nicola, then perhaps you could um, expand a bit on, on what you were saying a few minutes ago about um, the future of housing in um, in Cheshire and sort of some of these new opportunities, intergenerational living and things. Have you? That might be the sort of future opportunities. Have you seen? The, uh, recently any kind of emerging new sectors that have have kind of shown their head as, as having kind of particular interest at the moment among developers and, and you know end end users residents uh, yeah well i mean i think first and foremost housing delivery is absolutely fundamental to everything that philip talked about at the start so everywhere that we want to get the cheshire economy to um in sorry in every way we want to get the cheshire economy to grow we need a a suitable appropriate housing offer to support that so it's it's absolutely part of the economic strategy for Cheshire um, uh, to make sure that we're delivering the right type of houses in the right locations and and at the right pace which you know as ever across the housing market is quite simply just not quick enough at the moment I think that's obviously a well reported and well understood um, challenge that we all face um, in terms of emerging sectors, um, I think the housing market across Cheshire is is relatively traditional. I don't that is not a criticism, but I do think it is relatively traditional in its form. Um, you know, it's interesting hearing Philip talk about some of the economic challenges that that we face, the more subtle economic challenges that we that we face in terms of this almost emergence of a, a hidden economy, people that we're losing from the economy because they're of a certain age, they're of a certain affluence. You know, that is borne out because of the, the housing market and, and the types of homes that we've delivered in Cheshire historically. I think that the um, the challenges that we face within our town and city centres is a massive opportunity for this particular location to genuinely diversify um, type and tenure and, and to actually respond to some of the um, lifestyle pressures that are coming out, have come out of the last nine months. People, as Philip's quite rightly alluded to, moving out of 
um, perceived more more um, intense, crammed city centres choosing to live in other locations. So this this idea of being able to deliver higher density living across Cheshire is a real great opportunity. Um, I don't think that has to always mean apartments and something that we are working quite hard on uh, on a lot of the brownfield work that we're doing at the moment is is innovation within high density living within town and city city contexts uh, moving away from you know high rise apartment led to um, you know really clever use of uh, maisonettes um, townhouses stacked houses things like that so I think innovation in delivery is really important it would be remiss of me to not talk about um, modular construction and the role that that has to play in terms of speeding up housing delivery and I'm sure that will come through in in uh, the discussion the the second panel discussion as well and um, the final thing that, that I would say just just in terms of um, you know the work that we're doing day to day the planning applications that we're dealing with um, the the interest in the market the people that we see spending money on progressing housing delivery registered providers in the affordable housing sector is absolutely prime at the moment it is a real active area and rightly so um, and I think that the registered provider affordable housing market as it has itself got a lot of innovation um, to come so that's a particular sector that we're focusing on um, as a business at the moment brilliant really interesting okay so lots going on there um we we actually only have sort of just over five minutes left of our session it's gone really quickly um we haven't talked about a, another big topic which is transport um philip touched on this in his presentation um about the sort of crew um growth corridor linked to hs2 um but there's also northern powerhouse rail um the the body there just put in there sort of detailed bid or, or, or sort of vision um, for that quite recently. And I wonder if um, Jamie and Jane, you know, what are the opportunities for your two sort of hub areas for, for better connecting them up with the rest of the region and the rest of the country? Um, how well served are, are your kind of hubs at the moment? Are there, are there some sort of gaps? Do you want to go first, Jamie? Yeah, so I think our, our hub is, we're within close proximity to so a couple of mainline railway stations that serve Manchester down to London and, and the wider national network and then also the international airport. But I think the challenge we have and, and a number of other sort of key commercial sites have within Cheshire and Warrington is um, sort of the last mile connection. So we're a mile and a half from Oldley Edge train station. And whilst there's eight services in peak times for staff, it's it's getting them from the station to the site that last mile and a half which is just a bit too far for them to walk um so we are we're addressing that with our own private coach service we're putting on in a car share scheme improving cycling facilities but um i think the more that we can do in a, in a joined up manner across the across the area um to address that last mile connection the better mm. Okay, and what do you think? So, more more broadly, what do you think are the opportunities for the sort of sub region? Um, you know, in terms of northern powerhouse rail and, and and things and delivery of goods around the area and and products and services. I think it's it, it's connecting internationally through the airport and and then out or in and out of the airport across the the northern powerhouse region. I think is. Um, mm -hmm. That, you know the airport whilst it's not within Cheshire is it's the largest outside London by quite some distance um, with far more international reach than Leeds or, or Birmingham or a lot of other airports in the area or outside of London in the UK. Okay hmm. I thought it was interesting actually um, what I think it was um, Philip was saying about um, about how there's an awfully big proportion of, of people as well without driving licenses um, coming into the area and um, and that that's you know that ties in with this last mile um, connection that you talk about. Um, Jane, what's your view on this wider transport piece um, for the region and what what the kind of any missed opportunities are if, if any or any gaps? Um, I think where we're located is it a great location in regard to the the m6 corridor and the as jamie mentioned the proximity to the airports that with international investors that is a big tick in the box and obviously being you near know, the ship canal and port salford and um, port cheshire sorry and links to liverpool to the deep water terminal that is a big tick in the box as well in regard to the jobs that will be created there isn't 
the railway station isn't sufficient, which is at Station Road. So there has been some um, studies done on that. I think it was called the Cheshire Cord and linking that up on the, the potential of a new station, which would bring workers in. Um, so that probably needs addressing as well as the perhaps another junction on the, the M56. There is no junction 13. Um, in regard to actual transport and, and trends, hydrogen seems to have gone completely off the scale. Of, everyone is talking about hydrogen, especially again with Boris's 10 point plan, he mentions hydrogen. So um, there are a lot of fleets looking to decarbonize and, and use hydrogen as a transport fuel. So I think that is probably the way that's going to go. That's really interesting. Yeah, I remember we reported on that fairly recently, actually, about how there was a pilot going on, I think, to uh, uh, with the fleet to, um, yeah, hydrogen. I don't know how you, what the word would be, but yeah, to test that out. Um, OK, great. We've got we've got one minute um, left and I'm, I'm just going to wrap up by asking Philip just a, a kind of a, a news update, really. You and it's about funding. And when we when we spoke in September, um, your, the LEP had just submitted a bid to government asking for funding for some of the projects that we've, we've already talked about. Um, and you you mentioned the, that one of the things you'd asked for was the tax increment financing um, mechanism for approval to use that. Um, but there was also other sort of types of funding you'd asked for. And I just wondered, um, have you heard any further on that? When do you expect to? Um, and how confident are you um, that you'll okay. get what you Right. Well, the, the first of those was to get building fund and that gave us 15 and a half million pounds that's funded the lab at Woodley Park uh the sort of the drainage in uh, Chester and also the electric the, the bus station in Warrington um the tax income financing I covered that in my presentation that is a live conversation with uh with government at the moment uh and we'll have to see how um how benign the treasury are sort of following uh, following yesterday's statements um everything else um the you know, you referred a little earlier to the, the four billion pound levelling up fund. Uh, actually, there's, going to, there's 600 million pounds of that going to be made available, uh, I think, in the next financial year, which if you do the calculations, uh, sort of possibly puts us sort of uh, in line for perhaps 15, another 15 million pounds, uh, maybe a bit less than that, maybe a bit less than that. So um, that's... Um, and then there's also sort of references to um, some sort of early projects around um, uh, the UK Share Prosperity Fund. So, um, uh, so you know, uh, uh, what we are doing is we're sort of looking at the, the pipeline that we submitted to uh, government to get building fund. Um, we're looking at that. We're looking at updating it. Also looking at sort of some of the some of the other steers. The, the steer last time was they wanted projects that could just be delivered really really fast. Now the steer is more around uh, jobs and uh, jobs and regeneration, which maybe gives you sort of a slightly a slightly different uh, a slightly different balance. So um, uh, it's probably going to be kind of realistically January February before um, we get a bit more detail from government about how we can sort of apply for those and the criteria they'll be using. But in the meantime, we're we're doing the preparatory work so that we're you know, we've got really good business cases to submit just as soon as though that opportunity is is formally opened up. Sure. Great. OK, thanks, Philip. Actually, just one final question for Nicola um, on and it's uh, sort of on the policy question. Um, I, I wonder we're going to be discussing this more in the second panel, but planning reform. Um, yeah, the, the sort of proposed planning reforms and the housing allocation numbers are included in the, the, the Robert Jenrick um, reforms that were outlined earlier this year. How do you think they're going to impact the county? Will they, will they make it easier or harder to bring forward schemes? What have I got about 20 seconds to answer that uh, that question? <laughs> um, you, you've got to well, it, it depends what side of the fence he's sitting on, I think, Sarah. Look, I, I think housing delivery, um, meeting housing numbers is going to be very, very challenging. I think it's going to be politically challenging. I think the, the brownfield green belt uh, or greenfield green belt debate in Cheshire um, is, is going to continue to be incredibly interesting. I think. Um, 
I think there's a there's a responsibility, there's a need for all the local authorities um, to to really explore and exploit their brownfield assets, and I think that will make that conversation a lot easier. Uh, but I think um, the the um, the reforms, you know, Generic's piece on this is is pretty clear. That there are no excuses. We have to start building houses at the rate that we have to start building houses. So I think uh, from a personal perspective, I think we've got to go through a due process. I think we've really once and for all got to get to grips with our brownfield land assets. I think we've got the responsibility to use those to regenerate our urban areas. And then I think there will be a conversation about green belt release as as there is generally across um, the majority of the northwest of England at the moment. Yeah. So it's going to be an interesting period of time. Yeah, absolutely. OK, brilliant. Uh, that's a good sort of taster for um, some of the conversation in the next session as well. Um, so I think that's all we've got time for now, folks. So um, a virtual round of applause to our speakers for a brilliant and very thorough conversation, I think, and um, to our attendees as well um, for your presence. Um, do keep asking um, questions to the panel and we'll get through those in the next session as well. Could I ask you to stay on for the networking break and we'll be back for the second half um, panel at 11.30 it is actually. Um, let's switch to networking mode. Thank you so much to everyone and see you shortly. Hi everyone. Thanks for joining us again on the main stage. Uh, we're going straight into our next panel discussion now, which will discuss how to overcome barriers to delivery of new homes, uh, jobs and sort of town centre regeneration um, schemes in Cheshire. Um, and also how the changing macro trends post COVID are, are changing how we think about our, our towns and cities and, and also rural areas. I'd like to welcome to the stage Steph Ramsden, Economic Growth and Regeneration Lead at Chesh Chesh Cheshire West and Chester Council. Sorry about that. Uh, Steve Alcock, Director of Development and Sales at Taurus. Chris Brady, Partner at Campbell Reith. Andy Farrell, Board Member of Chester Business Improvement District. And Nick Lee, Managing Director of NJL Consulting. If our speakers could activate their cameras and mics, please, if they haven't already. And do remember to submit any questions to our panel through the Q&A button, um, our audience, and we'll get through these um, as we go. Welcome to you all. Hi. 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 So um, my first questions to each panelist will be a bit of an introduction to each of their projects and areas of focus. Because um, we've got a lot of a lot of people working on, you know, lots things. So let's start with Steph from Cheshire West and Chester. What are the council's priorities for regeneration and growth and what are the opportunities for the industry to work with you on delivering these goals? So I think for us um, we've got a number of priorities around our key towns and city areas. We have recognised that the visions for these areas will move away from retail more to experience-led activities and increasingly we are looking at how housing and live workspace will play a huge role in, in, in the future prosperity of these areas. I think on the industrial side of things, obviously Ellesmere Port has been talked about quite a lot this morning. So we think from an innovation and an employment growth perspective, that's our that's our top priority really. But we have also got other industrial areas, including Winsford, um, where we will be looking at areas uh, and new businesses moving in there, linking in with some of our other transport networks. So I think me as me as a person, I'm also on a housing board in Liverpool. So I've got a real interest in in how housing can be an economic driver and also um, supporting local economic growth. I think we've talked a lot about new homes building as well. And I think there's also a big retrofit agenda that, that, that we could also pick up on about making sure that our current housing stock is, is actually fit for purpose. Um, and I think with people working from home a lot, a lot more looking at reconfiguring homes will be a huge um, future opportunity perhaps. So hopefully that, that covers everything you're in, interested in, Sarah. I think we're more focused on the debate rather than ab about me. <laughs> Brilliant. No, thanks. That's really useful, Steph. Um, OK, um, staying within uh, sort of the same locality, Andy, you've recently been appointed to the board of the Chester BID, but you've got a long history of working with local authorities to bring forward projects. Um, yeah. What are your views on the health of the Cheshire development market right now? You know, has it been hard hit by COVID, do you think? Uh, I think it's a it, it, it's a mixed bag, I think. Um, and I think um, things are changing rapidly. 
I think it's a combination of COVID. It's a combination of the change in kind of how retail works. It's a change in how um, businesses are seeing their office floor space and how people are working from home and all that sort of thing. So I think we're in the middle of a big, a big change, which the pandemic has accelerated. Yeah. Um, so I think for places like Chester, for example, uh, the kind of smaller, you know, attractive historic places, uh, I think the future's bright, actually. Uh, people will want to live there. Um, and I think businesses will want to um, uh, locate in the middle of places like that. And I think the future of places like, like Chester is about, you know, residential in the heart of the, of the town. You know, that will generate foot flow. Um, uh, and I th but key to that, I think, in terms of the general reaction to the property market is, is this issue of speed and agility. Uh, I think for a long time, and I don't point to any local authority because I've worked for a number of them, um, uh, we've been too slow to react to opportunities. You know, we were talking about the bid the, bid the other day about um, uh, the, old, the old Ford site at the end of Bridge Street in Chester. It's been in planning for two years. You know, um, we just need to be quicker to react to those opportunities. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, just a, as a quick sort of follow up um, to your um, intro, then with your your sort of your, your so new to the to the bid to the bid. I'm not sure whether you call it bid or bid actually, but um, but correct me if I'm saying it wrong. Um, what would you say are the are the sort of um, top um, three things that are in your sort of intro at the moment, and that we could see progress on over the next six to twelve months? Yeah, um, uh, call it whatever you like. Business Improvement District. Um, uh, reopening next week is pretty high. Um, uh, and looking forward to finding out what tier we're in, um, to find out how far we can reopen. So that's the big one. Um, uh, we've just got our second term agreed, so we're moving the bid into a kind of broader, uh, more forward-thinking kind of approach. So uh, we were enhancing, promoting and representing, I guess you can, you can summarize what we're trying to do and working with what is our key partner outside our members, which is Steph's organization, the local authority, looking at um, rethinking the future of the town and the city. Um, so, you know, the one Chester plans being rethought, uh, the sustainable transport strategies being uh, rethought via a task group and the bids all involved in that but the key for us i think is to start thinking about chester in a different way to make it a really colorful cool more vibrant place that people want to live and work and visit and be in um uh, you know chester's been around for two thousand years so kind of what's the next two thousand going to be like brilliant okay thanks andy um Steve, you've just joined Taurus last month, I believe. Um, congratulations on your move. You're going to be working on some pretty sizable residential plans in Cheshire, such as the 400 Home Flowers Lane scheme near Crewe with Mulberry, for example. Um, what are the residential supply and demand dynamics like in Cheshire and how is Taurus going about filling in those gaps? You're right, Sarah. I've um, just joined Taurus, so eight weeks ago. But fortunately, I've um, worked in Cheshire for a number of years now. Um, Flowers Lane is our biggest scheme in, in Cheshire. But you know, as, a, as a housing association, one of the largest in the northwest, we've got a real spread of development across the county. Uh, a lot of that's focused in Warrington. We've got um, 10 schemes on site or in pipeline in Warrington. That's one of our heartland areas. And, and you know, to sort of counter what Andy was saying about, about Chester, you know, the, the pace of change in Warrington is really exciting. Uh, yeah, and and we, we're, we're really pleased to be part of that. And what we're trying to do is, is work with all the stakeholders there to shape how the town centre changes and the residential offer in Warrington. Um, but it, it, across the county, we've got, we've got everything from you know, 100 extra care units on the edge of Warrington to 400 units down in, in Crewe at Flowers Lane, um, to 13 units almost on the Welsh border, which surprised me 
you know, for a housing association, that's that's something quite different. Um, supply supply and demand in Cheshire is great. You know, th there is a very strong residential market, and our part of that is really making sure that it, it's accessible to all in the right places, because you've got pockets of wealth in Cheshire where where people are locked out, and unfortunately, you know, those pockets of wealth are quite often where the employment opportunities are. So the 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 sort of northeastern fringe of Cheshire, going into Greater Manchester, it's a, it's a really rich part of the county, but it's you know, it's it's just not accessible to our average buyer, who's a you know a thirty odd year old earning you know earning twenty six thousand pounds. So we need to, we need to address that, and we need to you know to to shape how that works, and it links quite nicely with the planning reforms and um you. Know, and changes to section 106 with the infrastructure levy because it's a concern to us you know there's there's no certainty really of how that's going to provide a clear pipeline of, of affordable units against new build development so the yeah, that's an, a, a significant thing for us as is just making sure that we're we're developing the right products in the right places within cheshire so as i say you know extra care units in warrington there's there's huge demand there, but we need more family houses in Warrington, and it's finding the right sites because if the market gets stronger and it you know, and it's always been very robust in Cheshire, it does make it harder for us as a housing association to acquire sites and develop those family houses. So we're you know, we're doing a lot of work and, and we're we're linked in with a lot with a lot of the right stakeholders, but yeah, it's a very busy market. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I think that's that's given a really good overview and a lot of those issues we're going to want to touch on um, in more detail, I think, later on. Um, so, um, Chris, uh, from Campbell Reef, you're working with tourists, I think, and others in Cheshire. Can you give us a bit of an update on your project and what opportunities and challenges you're noticing in the market that you think are likely to continue next year? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, our, our sort of business as a consulting engineer is focused on the, the hard end of delivery. Um, so we're very much um, assisting planning applications from a technical point of view, um, taking through approval processes not, and on to construction and design and getting our, our boots muddy on the site. Yeah, my, my team is currently working on the detailed design of all the, the highways and drainage and everything, the structures for Steve's scheme uh, in a crew, Flowers Lane scheme and crew, 400 units uh, with Mulberry. Um, so that's our biggest scheme in Cheshire at the moment, and that's just going through the planning process. So we're uh, doing battle with the planners there. Um, but really, you know, we saw as, as a residential focused business, I suppose, in Northwest, we did see a dip in you know, kind of activity at the beginning of the pandemic. But I definitely see that picking up now. Uh, I would say the last two or three months, you know, we've been busier than ever, both on private and public sector opportunities. We do a lot of work for Homes England through their multi-disc frameworks, those opportunities are coming out thick and fast. Um, and, and the private sector is also wanting to progress things. It's almost like a concertina effect. You know, they've had all this stuff that's just been stored up and they want to now release it all towards the end of the year. So we're in a very, very busy period trying to get a lot of schemes done prior to Christmas. Um, yeah, I, I do think it's challenging. Um, I mean, I'm particularly you know, doing a lot of work in a planning uh, arena with, with Nick, you know, he'll have similar views. We just find the planning process incredibly protracted these days and it's not getting easier i have to say that and there's changes in policy around brownfield greenfield sites nicola talked about that this morning you know we've got some changes in policy in terms of how runoff from those sites is dealt with and that is going to add another layer of complexity to the schemes and i just wonder how accessible that makes brownfield sites really uh you know uh, there was a lot of talk about brownfield being policy compliant but it's becoming more technically challenging does that change developers focus to greenfield i don't know it's an interesting question so there's a lot going on yeah we've done a lot of projects in cheshire for a variety of house builders planners developers etc i do see it's definitely an area of opportunity but i, I totally agree with what steve said about pockets of um, affluence um that's becoming exacerbated i think um and there, there are greater divides between various communities i see across the region really
Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Thanks, Chris. Um, OK, um, Nick, um, can you give us an overview of what you're doing um, in Cheshire, your work as a planning consultant? You know, what policy shifts are affecting your work or might affect it in the year ahead? Sure, Cheryl. Yeah, well, welcome to air traffic control in the heart of Cheshire. <laughs> Um, my actual priority is tidying the office up, uh, as you can see in the background. Um, yeah. But yeah, in terms of planning world, um, we historically have been doing a lot of, uh, if you say, if you like, say, quick win projects, straight running application work, uh, win those consents and get off and build. That shift is now occurring, particularly in Cheshire, to kind of more strategic uh, scenarios. Uh, we've actually got three pretty large projects. Uh, getting going at the moment. Obviously, I can't say too much specifically about what they are at the moment for confidentiality, but they will be challenging Greenbelt. Um, and that is probably a focus I know we may talk about a bit more today. Uh, but we're also dealing uh, hot off the press, because I was talking about this earlier with Steph, uh, with uh, hopefully a £50 million pound inward investment project at the same time. And we've been finding this shift towards very large scale logistics and, and, and industrial side of things. Uh, the affordable housing world that Steve's in as well is, is, has been growing significantly. You stages of planning. Um, the affordable housing side of that is growing rapidly. Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, your your sound actually dropped out for a minute. I'm not Sorry sure if you're in connection. No, don't worry. Uh, you might uh, a useful thing to do if there's some sort of connection issue is sometimes just to refresh your browser. So you'll you'll disappear for a minute, but you'll come back in. So, um, but I'll, I'll let you know if any any issues going forward. Um, so I think that was a really good, really good overview of um, of the work that each of you are doing at the moment. Um, so I'm keen now to drill down into how to successfully deliver mixed use schemes in such a sort of challenging or, you know, un still uncertain environment. Um, Steph, presumably COVID has brought some shifts that have affected some of the growth strategies the council is drawing up. Um, you know, retail for one continues to suffer. The working from home trend this year has kind of altered requirements for commercial space. Um, even even though industrial, as we've talked about, is is sort of, you know booming. Um, how are you dealing with those changes? And do you think there are more opportunities for sort of more innovative partnership working with the private sector, new funding mechanisms, perhaps, to deliver your aims? I'd say definitely. So um, in Cheshire, Western Chester, we applied for two future high street funds, one for Ellesmere Port Town Centre and one for Winsford. I think we were progressed with Winsford. So we got through to the next stage and we are still waiting to hear. Um, part, part way through the summer, we were asked to re review and refresh what that plan was going to uh, we had broad housing in um, as part of that as as future phases, but there was a real emphasis about um, changing the way they were calculating some of the benefits and really looking at what we wanted to develop for for the fu the future. So we ha we had a look at that scheme um, and and reviewed it um, in quite a lot of detail with um, MHC at CLG. We've also been working directly with the High Street Task Force in Ellesmere Port. So they had a pilot of 19 areas that they took for forward to really look at how you galvanize some of those local par partnerships and it's not about the council delivering everything it's about everybody having a voice in 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 some of those discussions so we are looking at the governance around how we take any bid for Ellesmere Port forward and how we really get other other folks involved in that I think we we had a master plan where it was a very rigid town center planning boundary rather than town center as people view town town centers or you know slightly out, out of town so specifically around those two areas that's what we are we, we are looking at i think for northwich as well we've we have actually seen quite a lot of interest and quite a lot of um retail and experience led still coming into the north the northwich center um, and we've got future plans in in partnership with our build and thrive partner which is through psp um, and we're working with housing associations shared office providers lots of different people really around the table at a very early stage so it's not formal market testing as such but it's really thinking about how we'd want to shape those plans going forward um, and I think we're working with other NHS partners as well and looking at the possibility of opening up other brownfield sites in those areas so I think we are taking a completely different look at it and I think I can't say I, 
I can't not include Chester in some of those things as well. So we've had a one city plan that has been around. We're, we're just over part way through now. Um, and we're starting to work with a group in Chester called the Good for Nothing Net Network. And that is an international movement, really, that works with so socially minded professionals to actually bring the voice of children, young people, other people who are around the city area who maybe don't use or don't engage with that city to really give them a voice and make sure that we are developing um, or putting plans together to develop a city that's suitable for everybody in, in, in the future, really. So we are taking a completely different look at, at, at things at Cheshire West, which I find quite refreshing, really. And I think our partnerships that we've developed closely throughout the pandemic are unprecedented really we've done things differently we've made decisions really quickly we've worked you know hand in glove with bids in Northwich and Chester um, and, and Winsford as well to actually distribute 71 mil million pounds worth of, of business support so um, I think our, our partnerships and dialogues have changed quite a lot and we want that to continue really. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thanks, Steph. Um, as uh, one member of the audience has just has noted, uh, Jane Howard Roberts, um, uh, Cheshire's in tier two. So it is perhaps just worth um, noting that, I guess, isn't it, in the context of our conversation that it's not in the tier three that um, a lot of the rest of the Northwest was. Um, Steph, just another one for you, actually. Um, you mentioned the, um, the Chester City Plan, um, but um, on Northgate, we did we did uh, talk about this a little bit in the first session, but it would be remiss of me not to ask you about it as well. Um, and we do have two questions up there that people asked in the first panel. Um, it has suffered delays and there's been funding and other obstacles. Um, there's been a bit of progress made in the last few months, I understand, and there's been some new lettings signed and things. What's the story here? Um, you know, what in your mind were the main challenges this scheme has faced? And is it full steam ahead now or are there other hurdles to overcome? I think in all of a scale of, of Northgate in a city centre, there, there will always be challenges. I think for the phase one, it's it's on the ground. We are we are delivering. We've got numerous leases signed. We've not heard any any noises that they aren't going to continue. So within within those markets, we are quite confident in those that have already signed. In terms of future phases. I think, you know, we are looking at that. There's nothing that's been determined yet. And I think the dialogue that we get through the one city plan discussions will really look to shape what happens in future phases. I think there's there's an issue there that was raised around um, should the site be controlled by the local council? Mm -hmm. I think we actually own the land around, around the, fu the future phases. So I think and it's about us being an enabler rather than a controller. And I think we have taken Northgate to MIPIN previously. We have marketed it to the private sector. We've looked for private investment. Um, but I think we are on, on that process of starting to design what no, what future phases should look like. So there isn't a, um, a strict plan of what's going to, go, going to go in there. We are working with the local enterprise partnership and also Homes England on what the housing should, should actually look like within within the um, future phases of, of Northgate and any additional um, assistance we may we, we, we may need with that so ho hopefully that answers the question if not I'll, I'll keep my eye on that Q&A &Q box yeah. and, uh, and pick it up. Absolutely thank you for that Steph okay um, Andy yes do you want to come in on that you know what would you like to see in Northgate perhaps and how does it link to this um, uh, this this piece that you brought up in your intro um, in your intro discussion about sort of the the interest in experiential space and sort of real mixed use but a sort of almost a different a different amount of mixed use different um, uses in this new climate. I think we need to get um, a bit more real about Northgate, really. Um, people get very anxious about Northgate. I mean, I, I was involved in Northgate when I was in Chester 16 years ago. Um, Northgate's missed two markets. It's been through three recessions um, and is still sitting there with people th thinking, what should we do with it? Um, it's great that the council getting on with phase one. So that's brilliant, Steph. Phase two is a residential scheme, so I don't know why we're having a discussion about what it should be or not. Um, it's pretty important that the local authorities involved in leading and coordinating it, it owns most of the land, and because it's very complicated and it's full of buildings at the moment, some very heavy buildings too, um, 
a local authority's role in terms of putting the site together uh, and getting rid of what's on the site. Um, you know, three basements of car parking and a market hall built like a like a, um, uh, a big silo. So, you know, the lo a local authority has to be leading it. Um, uh, but I think at the end of the day, it needs a really good private sector and imaginative private sector partners because private private sector is really good at coming up with imaginative residential schemes, which local authorities aren't. Um, uh, but the local authority has to be the key partner. So it's, 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 it's about real partnership. Um, the most important thing about Northgate, I feel, is speed um, uh, and being bold. Uh, one of the problems uh, is this many, uh, too many people with too many interests and too many views. Uh, and if a local authority tries to please everyone, it gets nowhere. Uh, and I think that's been the case with Northgate, to be honest. Um, uh, and I'll take my slab of blame for that one. Um, so just get on with it. That's my, that's my plea. Um, I think it can be really transformational. It's not that big a site, actually. Um, uh, so we shouldn't be too anxious about it. Um, but I think imaginative residential has got to be the key because that will create footfall. You know, there's no point imagining you're going to get any retailing in the future. Uh, retailing depends on footfall and footfall comes from in places like Chester. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's really interesting, Andy. Um, Nick, from a planning point of view, then, how can local authorities perhaps enable this this kind of imaginative de delivery uh, and faster delivery? You know? <laughs> that's a big question. Um, in terms of brownfield sites, I think um, early partnership is is the key, but it's with partners who have got the funding critically and the wherewithal to to deliver. I think with planning, we've got to make life easier in terms of process. Um, th there are tools there. I mean, we're dealing at the moment with a, a number of authorities in really pushing the planning promotion agreement routes, for example, but also trying to agree early what we don't want to be doing. We don't want to be cluttering ourselves up with um, uh, some of the detail that can bog down the determination of planning consents early on. Developers want certainty. And for me, taking, creating uh, situations where the certainty is achieved quickly is absolutely critical because the more certainty they have, the more money they will put into those projects and at more pace as well. And I think often there's a bit of a disconnect between uh, those conversations at planning level and at investment level, partly with authorities, but also we, we all have a role to play as well in terms of explaining why we need uh, to move quickly. Uh, to to planning uh, planning officers in, in councils as well. So for me, it's using the tools we've got, um, expanding how we use those tools, but creating signposts of certainty, if you like, to use a, a phrase, uh, for more investment. You know, I see projects at the moment where even on an outline consent, it's twenty documents, uh, all sorts of different pieces of work needed to prove your case, and you're like, just hold on a minute. Let's are we agreed or not agreed? We're doing this. Uh, and then let's move forward from there. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, how do uh, um, the rest of the panel feel about um, the, the proposed planning reforms then? Are they going to make things easier um, in this regard um, or, or not? <laughs> um, I don't know whether um, Chris or Steve would like to come yeah, in. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I'm going to wholeheartedly agree with what Nick has said. I'm, I'm coming at planning from very much a technical point of view. So we're doing a whole raft of technical inputs into a planning application. And you know, I have to say, bitter recent experiences, we're having to almost design the job and solve all the problems at outline planning stage. And it's just frustrating the developers, unfortunately. And, and I, I don't know whether it's a lack of resource in the planning authority or inexperience, but I sometimes feel the questions they're asking of us, the developer world, are, are simply asked to buy them a little bit more time. Um, so they can go away and consider the application maybe a bit further. But but yeah, what Nick has said, I, I can 100% agree with. We're up, we're being being asked for more and more ridiculous levels of detail, uh, outline planning, and and uh, it just frustrates the whole thing. And my view is, you've got outline, let's crash on and do it. I think the planning authority should believe in the developers a bit more. Um, you know, they do do this stuff. They're very good at this stuff. 
we don't need everything uh, nailed down to the, the nth degree before we, we get a, a decision notice given to us. And that, I think, is the biggest frustration from our, our technical point of view. You know, you're, you're designing a job and you know full well there's a reserve matters application to go in and you're going to be redoing it again. It just seems a bit of a waste of time and effort, really. And I just wish the planning authorities would be a lot more pragmatic, I think, is my, my view, really. Mm. I'd like to get Steph's response on that. But first, mm. you, you wanted to come in on that one. I mean, I can't resist, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's such a good question. But I think it, yeah, it, it's fair to say that we all recognise the system's just massively underfunded as well. And, and Nick touched on it there. But yeah, in terms of planning reform, um, first and foremost, there, there needs to be enough resource within the authorities that deal with it. And I think it, 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 it's probably partly why, um, picking up on Chris's point, we're being asked for so much information because they just simply haven't got the time and you know, and and the people to, to deal with some of it. And uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a conversation about a site just earlier this morning, and it wasn't in Cheshire. I'm pleased to say, but um, yeah, it was about if we were to present a very bog standard scheme that that fell in line with you know, every policy, the the planning officer would welcome it, but because we're producing something that's a bit more creative and you know, a mixed tenure and you know, streets and things. Uh, the planning officers you know, immediately a little bit resistant because they just see a headache there. And that's wrong, isn't it? You know, we they should really be encouraging that. But I, you know, I feel for them. I really do. I, I definitely wouldn't take a job there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I just add to that, Sarah? Um, it's a good yeah. point. You know, and again, I have some sympathy uh, for, for the public sector and planning authorities. We're about to start work on a very large regeneration scheme in the Midlands, and that's for a combined authority. And those guys are actually putting resource into the planning authority, you know, people, people and money, because it's such a large scheme, um, to help the planning authority deal with it. And maybe that's something we should consider that the private sector helping the public sector perhaps the public sector should go out to the private sector and go out to a planning consultant like Avis and Young and say look we need help with this application can you help us there isn't you know there isn't a great wall between us we're all trying to achieve the same thing we all want to society to benefit from our work uh, but often it's society putting the hurdles in the way a little bit so I was quite pleased to hear the job we're about to start I can't name it um, but yeah they're going to actually put resource into the planning authority to, to help them you know assess the application and get through to, to, to positive determination i hope that's really really interesting mm. um and yeah maybe we'll see more of that then mm. andy you were keen to come on and come in on that one yeah i mean just going back to the planning reforms i was really supportive of them actually i mean anything that takes junk out of the system um uh is good i think through the kind of decades planning is layered one on top of each other um uh, and although not not perfect, the kind of the, the reforms start to delayer that, uh, particularly the viability thing in local plans. Um, you know, to prove the viability of major developments at an early stage within a local plan is just bizarre. Um, uh, and freeing that up means that local plans can be far more creative, uh, because you know local plans post last 15, 20 years. Um, you're not going to know what the viability is going to be on year two. You know, it's ridiculous. And you've got 15 years to develop the viability. The, the issue for me really is about um, capacity in local authorities. I think planning is under capacity, well, woefully under capacity. There's an issue about confidence. And I think planners have lost their confidence. Um, so they think they're independent. They're not. They're supposed to be partial. Um, uh, there is a local plan that says, you know, this should be developed. So why are you arguing about it? You know, uh, support it. There's an issue about leadership. Um, no kind of leadership in the planning profession, particularly in local authorities, which 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 direct them to make decisions. Um, so and there's too much politics, basically. Um, uh, which is always done planning. So I think the reforms are going in the right direction. I think more more delayering of the system um, uh, would be useful. 
having been around planning for god i 40 years <laughs> um i'm still of the belief that that any planning application no matter how big can be determined within eight weeks or 13 weeks it's easy actually and anyone that says that's got they've got a planning application in for two or three years it's just nonsense uh, you can make a decision within 13 weeks easily if you make if you put your mind to it can yeah. I on that? yeah uh, could i just ask andy while he's talking about planning about this question from the audience about this planning promise to get feedback on planning within five weeks and a fast turnaround it worked this was at warrington yeah C can you just explain what that is and, and then we'll start come to you, Nick. <laughs> There was a couple of things. It mainly came about as a result of Omega, really. Um, um, Omega, you, you all kind of, many of you know, it, the biggest undeveloped employment site in Europe um, about four years ago, five years ago. Um, when we started working with uh, the developer, Millers, uh, and some of the occupiers wanted to come in quickly, um, speed was of, of, of great importance because we were in competition with the lo other logistic sites. So they were saying, well, if you can give us a quick decision, we'll come to your site as opposed to this site or the other site. And we said, we'll guarantee a decision within five weeks. And we structured ourselves up to be able to deliver that. Um, in essence, they took about six weeks. Um, but um, you just, you just program managed it. We got... Our planners were supported by a couple of really um, good program managers who weren't planners, and they ensured that the system worked. Now, the application came in, and it was um, it was ratified and registered within a day. Um, and they came in at weekends to do that sometimes. Um, that uh, we had a, a development team uh, approach where the highways people the planners environmental health all came in with the developer and therefore any issues were sorted out in the first week um and it went through that kind of program managed approach and the decision popped up in um in six weeks including going to committee ah okay that's really interesting andy um nick what was it you wanted yeah, to say just in terms of reform uh, with the question you, you you posed um we talked a bit about process issues in councils and I, I totally understand and agree with some of those and indeed I've often found planning is most responsive where it is directly sitting next to chief execs and those chief execs who recognize the power of planning and the ability to speed up that process I think win basically so that that connection to chief exec I think is absolutely essential I think with the reforms um there's, there's positives and negatives about all of this, I have to say. And we've got a lot to see to come out yet in terms of the levelling up agenda and how those housing numbers are going to work. Um, you know, yesterday was a big piece of news that wasn't really touched upon. Green Book reform and cost benefit analysis, a huge, huge positive for the North in terms of major infrastructure investment in the future with public funding. Um, a lot of things are pointing towards that levelling up agenda even more. <clears throat> One part of the reforms I have real concerns over um, is the, dare I say, slightly idealistic attempt at saying that the local plan can be made easy and then everything follows. Okay, The consequence of the process at the moment, I think, will be that every man and his dog will make planning applications on those sites that they're promoting through the local plan because they've got everything to win or lose at that point in time. Through the local plan so the examination of that local plan may have 20 developers 30 developers or whatever and you're going to have all those applications running and they're all going to be at high risk they're all going to throw the money in so the people with the, the most money the people with the most resource they will go for those sites and prove that they can be delivered and the the third strand and i'm going to keep mentioning green belt but I have to we have to face up to green belt issues in a really much more constructive manner it's a two binary a debate at the moment just look at the kickoff with gmsf uh, and the stockport and everyone else throwing throwing their toys out of the pram now we can't go down those routes when it comes to green belt analysis and so far you know every local plan i've been involved in it's always been we need housing we've got to deal with green belt 
and I would look at it in a very different way to say, hold on a minute, what are all the public requirements you need? What are the infrastructure requirements you need? What type of housing? How are you going to put that together? And where are you going to get the benefits? Because you can leverage far more benefits out of greenfield sites. And I, you know, a proposition that I would put forward, dare I say, potentially a project we're working on, if we provide a major public transport node, 100% zero carbon, a type of housing that can be delivered quickly, so it's just build to rent with a fund at the end of it, affordable housing and retirement care, Everyone would say, that's brilliant. What a fantastic proposition. Oh, and I can do it in two years. But it's Greenbelt. And we have to go through a local plan process that will take years, whatever the reforms. So trying to stir it up a little bit, but I think there's a lot of good that could come quickly through um, statutory instrument changes, by the way, not, not primary act. But the, the whole local plan has to be primary act issues. And I, given the way the Conservative Party are over there at the moment, where most of them don't want it to change, by the way, now, uh, I think we've got a long way to go, unfortunately. OK, thanks, Nick. Um, okay. I'd like to uh, I'd like to ask you your views on on this this whole conversation, actually, Steph. You know, there's a lot in there. There's a lot of chat about local authorities and their role here, about lack of resourcing in planning at local authorities. Um, I thought that the, the the sort of chief planning officer having you know sitting next to the chief exec um, uh, idea. You know, I wrote something about a year ago or eighteen months ago before I joined Place, which was actually a study showing how few chief planning officers were at that that rung of the ladder at the moment, and that that's changed a lot in recent years. Um, so I wonder what your view on this is, and particularly given the context that. In the reforms, there's this, you know, proposed housing delivery market um, uh, or target um, changes, and apparently this would nearly triple the current requirement in in Cheshire West. Um, so, you know, what are the issues there, really? <laughs> That's a lot of questions in one. <laughs> but um, okay. I'm going to caveat my response first. I'm not a planner, so I I started my days in in finance so I am not a planner so first of all that I'll caveat that response but I have a really good relationship with with our planning team and looking at our response to the white paper we we totally agree that local planning authorities are significantly underfunded um, but I think as well as being underfunded it's quite difficult to attract and keep quality staff quite quite a lot of the time so we do find ourselves almost taking on the the new the the, the newly qualified training them up working with them on some fantastic schemes and then private private practice comes and comes and poaches them from us so you know you're welcome for that um, and I think really it's about how future um, planning really needs to be properly funded so whether that's from support from the private sector Or proper at the start what does it actually take to determine a plan and application um, those those type of things really so they, they they're the type of things that we think need need to be look at looked at in more detail um, I, I've worked at other local authorities and I think we also took a program management approach where it, it was driven by the program and priority it was split around you know not not just first come first served it was about you know does that have a greater impact for our our, our, our local environment is it one of the priority schemes and we also had a development team approach so where you assign specific people to deal with those planning applications and they lived and breathed it for one year two years there were some really complex schemes and I think I think it is a bit how how we were, were more innovative what I would say about the devolved authorities are is they have a, a lot more cash floating around and a lot more flexibility around funding pots and um, so they do have the ability to make schemes go faster by throwing resource at it so I suppose I'd, I'd welcome um, some feedback from private sector in, in the future really to say would they be prepared to fund um, an additional planning resource to make to make things move move faster for them and you know how how would they uh, view something like that really um, so I think that's the first one around reform I think is that is that covered it Chris did you want to well, I was only well? going to say um, great idea uh, Certainly my experience on the technical side, when we're trying to get schemes approved and adopted and through to construction, local authorities are working with 
private consultants to provide that resource. You know, we, we interface with other consultants who check our work effectively, but the portal is the, is the, is the local authority. I just wonder if you could, you could almost do the same for planning, really. You know, there are, there are plenty of planning consultants. I, I bet Nick would jump at the chance to we, we do, support some we local do authorities. Do that. So okay, we do, yeah, we do. that's good to know then, really. We do complement our existing core staff with some of the more simpler applications going external um, to get through some of those volumes. So it's not it's not perfect, um, yeah. but I think you know we are we are looking at how how we can do things things differently. What I'd say around the house and numbers is looking at our achievements to date. So over the last ten years, we've we've pretty much outperformed our our targets. So I think I think we've outperformed them. I did write write this down before by almost four thousand over the last ten years. So I think we have seen um, we've got a target of a thousand a year. Last year we did sorry this year to twenty twenty we did um, almost two thousand, but that that was reduced by three hundred compared to last year. So so we were well over two thousand last year and and that and that was due due to the delays towards the end of March with with, with COVID um so I, I think for us you know looking at house and numbers we've got some really strategic sites coming up we're working in partnership with, with the LEP and Homes England about looking at those pathfinder sites um and and looking at how we deliver things within town centres but also within the sites that some of our new town centre developments will unlock and almost triangulate in some of those um to say, well, if we do town, if we do town centre housing here, um, we're going to relocate X from from there over here, and that and that will leave a development site. How can we bring that forward? So we're having some really interesting discussions with the financial support of the LEP and also and also Homes England. So it does go back to one of the earlier points about doing things in partnership and not on our own. And I think we are really listening to what other partners have got to say as well. Sure. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for that, Steph. Um, Steve, um, I'd like to ask you a question about um, the sort of uh, the future of housing um, and perhaps the sort of diversity of housing um, in Cheshire. Um, I wonder what I wonder if you've got some sort of observations that you'd like to make on the sort of rise of like emerging kind of specialist housing sectors in Cheshire and what the opportunities are there. Um, and also whether you'd like to comment at all on um, this sort of green green belt NIMBY issue and how that might kind of um, provide some barriers to um, to delivery of those schemes. That's a big question, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, as I said earlier, we've got a hugely diverse portfolio across Cheshire. Um, hopefully, you know, we've just added to Steph's numbers this year because we've just started on site in Ellesmere Port with 260 units uh, in partnership with Amwell. Um, it, we, our, our product range spans from you know, uh, you know, bungalows, apartments, so we've got 140 units in central Warrington, uh, a, a big apartment scheme that's eight storeys. It's a rented product through to, you know, um, extra care as I mentioned earlier and over 55s apartments and specialist accommodation so tourists really deal with every aspect of the market I think the emerging parts of that market um, won't be surprised to anybody it's really second age accommodation so you know for for people that need to downsize um, whether that's the you know, apartments bungalows extra care um, it, that is a, a big focus for us and unfortunately there's, you know, there's demand for that across Cheshire whether that's Warrington whether that's Northwich where we've got a scheme at the moment um, or in Chester but alongside that there's a real demand for but quality family homes and obviously that expectations changed over the past year and and I do think we all collectively need to come together and look at how that that is shaped over the next 10 years yeah because expectations have changed you know, we we're all going to be working at home that bit more now um you know, there's a there's a real opportunity to localize things and revitalize towns across cheshire because no one wants to get in the car and travel into manchester or wherever it might be to work in the same way but Let's provide homes where they're energy efficient, that you know, they're, they're good quality. The infrastructure is there so you can get about on a bike or, or you know, a walk. 
and 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 you can tie that in with revitalizing the towns so that's that demand has always been there but i think we re, really re need to reshape the offer that we put out there and that includes you know tourists will be part of that definitely and we're already looking at, at what we do there and how the next 10 10 years look for us and what we what we provide yeah. um i'm yeah i'm not going to get into nimbyism and and the issues of, of you know of whether we should develop greenfield um but but i you know, i do think there needs to be a strong emphasis on on you know, brownfield first and but let's recognize that if you're doing brownfield that site is probably an old employment site so that old employment site must reappear somewhere else in, in cheshire it's probably you know it, it's probably a substantial warehouse that was a greenfield site as well so yeah we there is an element of yes brownfield first but there's, there's got to be some green belt give here and nick pointed out a really good example earlier if all the component parts are right and it's the right scheme maybe we do need to look at at you know, at, at greenfield okay thanks steve just a, a follow-up for you is um this question from david tonks in the audience um he talks about uh, isn't there also a big piece of market intelligence missing across Cheshire discussion is about innovative or imaginative housing schemes but based on what understanding or evidence do you have any comments to make on that um so have a look at the question um I mean yeah I've just touched on innovative and imaginative housing schemes you know what yeah. i think i think we yeah you, know, you look at cheshire east there's a design guide there which is great and it gives a a blueprint for quality and design expectation but i I'd, I'd like to see that move a step further and let's see how do we design for the next 20 years how do we make sure that houses you know, are, are really at the cutting edge of where they should be you know in terms of electric cars we're going to all going to be driving them in 10 years time so are we are we preparing for that now? The energy efficiency. I'm sat here freezing in a Victorian house, whereas I used to be in a nice warm office. So our houses need to be really efficient with low bills because we're going to spend more time at home. So there is there's a, there's a you know, we the intelligence is out there and the industry will adapt to that intelligence definitely. But at a government level, we need clear policies, and then at a more local level that needs to be pushed within within the local plan process and the other policies that are applicable so we're really driving forward with it okay brilliant um thanks steve um, now andy had his his hand up a, a, a few minutes ago and then nick um you also wanted to say something um should we start with you andy yeah I, I, it picks up on um uh, a conversation a few minutes ago where, where I think people now, because of the pandemic and working from home and all sorts of other kind of uh, challenges that are affecting them, want homes that um, uh, are attractive in attractive places where they want to live. Um, and perhaps we're now seeing, as I said before, you know, the, 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 the emergence of places like Chester as, as, a, as, a, as a destination for urban living in a way that perhaps we wouldn't have imagined a few years ago. And a certain warranty is going through that, that as we speak. So, you know, homes that, that are places that people want to live in and um, future proofed homes so they can live in them longer and they can bring up a family, etc. Uh, in, in these places. The, the interesting thing is um, uh, the left did a bit of a bit of work a, a year or so ago, and I was involved in it as well, looking at Cheshire in terms of where young people wanted to live. Um, and crew came up as an opportunity, Warren's a real opportunity, and Chester came in as a really strong opportunity of people wanting to, young people wanting to, to, to live in a place like Chester. So I think it's a real opportunity that Chester has to, has to grasp, um, which points to Northgate and residential, I think, as well as other sites in Chester. The interesting thing for me is young people get older and they have families, uh, which means they perhaps would want to think about living in the suburbs rather than the town centre. So I think this debate about greenfield and brownfield and brownfield first is just kind of a bit nonsensical, really. You need both. You need both in terms of numbers and you need both in terms of providing 
um, the type of accommodation that people want to live in as they go through their lives. Okay. I think that's really interesting, Andy. Yeah. Um, Nick, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, sure. It's just uh, with comments Steve made, which I thought was really interesting. Um, we're doing elsewhere uh, two, four and a half million square foot shed sites at the moment. And they're being released from Greenbelt and Open Countryside without anyone worrying, which I find really interesting <laughs> in this debate. Whereas if those same sites were being looked at for 800, 900 houses, there'd be a lot of issues arising. Um, so that's the first comment I was going to make. Um, the second on evidence base and, and the question actually um, that was raised, I mean, the evidence we're seeing from the shift in work we're doing is, is very clear to us about care, retirement living, uh, affordable housing and the rental market. Absolutely. Um, the interesting thing there is they're all in competition with normal house builders. So the competitive side of this has expanded immensely in the last five or six years or so in terms of land. Uh, and that has a consequential effect about land values and such like uh, as well. So I think we've got to be you know, be understanding that the market's very wide. And, and there was actually something recently, I think it was a Nye Frank report specifically about the Cheshire area and the the, the absolute requirements for um, retirement and care living in the future is, is significant. I think one of the challenges for both uh, Cheshire East and Cheshire West in particular as authorities is that they're going to have to restart the cycle. And I think Cheshire West ultimately will be doing sooner rather than later over their local plan preparation. The, the evidence that informs those is now very dated. So Cheshire West evidence goes back to, I'm guessing, about 2009-10, I think, originally. Cheshire East is about 2011-12. And then they both went through quite lengthy plan processes because I was involved in both. But they, they were based on quite a lot of old evidence. And I suspect, given the, the need under national policy to cater for all housing needs, underline the word all, the, the evidence-based scenario coming forward is going to be very, very segmented. There's going to have to be a very careful analysis of every element of housing requirement here. And how are you going to solve that conundrum overall, notwithstanding the, the standard method uh, matter, where the numbers are higher already on the current position, if leveling up goes the way everyone says it should go, those numbers are going to be higher, not lower as well. So there's going to be a, this, this huge pressure already building in the market. The planning system will not be quick enough for that pressure because of the system. And that's the massive disconnect that we've got out there at the moment, where a lot of people simply say, well, because it's green, but we're going to have to wait for the local plan. My challenge, if you like, out to local authorities and developers is to say, hold on a minute, shouldn't we have a different conversation? Shouldn't the conversation be what type of green belt sites are the best choices to make early? Let's engage early. And maybe there should be conversations about people saying, well, actually, we're going to have to make some early decisions now. Otherwise, we're waiting forever on this. So I think that's, a, that's the difficult one because of the politics. Um, but just to add more evidence, when we did um, the seashell case, um, over Sotport, which I think many will be able to be aware of. It's a very big decision last April. We've followed up now with the, the detail on the residential. And because of the use of social media in COVID world, more people are supporting that scheme than are objecting. Why? Because the people supporting it are the ones that actually want the damn houses. That's the difference. Yeah. And suddenly the, the conversation's changing because everyone's realizing, well, yeah, we desperately need this. And can I have one? Can I have one? Can I have one? As opposed to a screen, but we don't want it. And, and that social media engagement and the young people, dare I say it, are the ones they need to shout out because my, my perhaps slightly controversial last point is politicians li listen to those who shout loudest. And unfortunately, those who shout loudest, I think, I believe, are often in the minority in terms of what people want out there. New schools, extended schools, and new housing for all. It's not, it's not, it's no brainer to me, but grasping it early is not happening. And, and that's a major issue that I think is just going to perpetuate a lot of problems that we face. Mm -hmm. I wonder if uh, the, the sort of move towards digital, um, mm. digital planning uh, techniques, consultations, et cetera, has mm. sort of enabled um, authorities and developers, et cetera, and, and, and planners to 
access a sort of um, or tap into a, a wider group of people as well and stakeholders and it is it is Sarah that. it's absolutely right and I think I'd like to see that grow because I think then politicians will see the the whole picture as opposed to quite a narrow picture uh, out there within their own constituencies okay really interesting and um, as uh, David Morris in the audience says um, he believes there should be a greater discussion and education over the definitions and use of green belt, green field, open countryside and brownfield land, because, of course, they're not all the same. Green belt is not the same as green field. Um, many people don't understand the basics. Um, so, yeah, we, we've got to wrap up in a sec. But Steve, um, Steve and Chris, do you do you two have a, a final point to make um, before we wrap up? Yeah, I'm at, I was going to say at the risk of being slightly controversial, um, you know, we do a lot of work for Homes England and I always saw those guys as being the kind of leaders in market quality, um, driving innovation, driving delivery, um, re really kind of putting it out there a little bit. Uh, our recent projects we've been involved with where we've created master plans for outline applications, uh, et cetera, et cetera, those are now being scrutinised. Um, by Homes England, uh, by a third party, in an attempt to squeeze more units onto sites in often very challenging topographical areas, areas of contamination, with, without a real appreciation of the constraints on the site. And I just, I just worry that it's being driven by the numbers now, and it's not being driven by the quality. I know we spoke about this before, uh, and I think Andy had a view. And, and I've seen, I've, I'm beginning to see evidence. You know, and I don't want to diss Homes England because they're a massive client of ours, don't get me wrong. Um, but it seems to be driven by the numbers. And if we're talking about quality placemaking, where people actually want to live, do people want to live in a small house? It's a kind of one down, two up type thing. I, I just worry about that kind of morphing, really. Um, that's just my, my final point. Really. I've, I've seen that on, on, a sev on, well, on several, on two or three projects of relate, really. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, Steve, do you want to add to that at all? Thanks, Sarah. It's it's a, go back to the uh, planning reforms that we've talked about in quite some depth, but it's you're picking up on Nick's point. Um, what we what we need is more clarity on the benefits of development. I think you know, that's where the public really fall down. It's it, it's never been that clear. It's been you know, buried in section one of six agreements and um, still, it's going to get even less clear as we move forward. And the one thing I, you know, I'd love everybody to, to, you know, to shout about is the fact that we we just need positive messages coming out of development. It's it's not a bad thing if it's well thought out and you know, and it achieves the drivers that we need to achieve. But let's let's explain, you know, how it benefits schools, how it benefits the parish, how you know, how it supports the local town centre, how we'll put you know green infrastructure in there. And improve biodiversity, and I, I really worry with the planning reforms. It's going to be even muddier. It really is because it's going to be less clear if it falls into a general infrastructure levy pot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Um, right, we do have to wrap up, Andy. I know you had one point to make. Do you think you could make it in about thirty seconds, or <laughs> or less? About homes. In um, totally agree. Homes England, although of late, have been totally focused on the southeast. And the affordability issue and deliverability in the southeast and their priority. The challenge I would give Homes England, if I may, is to get more involved and lead the northwest and particularly Cheshire in terms of housing delivery. And perhaps the first pilot they could do is housing on Northgate. Okay, okay, that was that was pretty much within thirty seconds, I think, Andy, as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, we could go on and talk about all of these uh, subjects for absolutely hours, I'm sure, but um, we must wrap out wrap up to allow people time to do a bit more networking before the end of the event. Um, so, what a great conversation! Um, thank you so much to all of our speakers. Um, for their comments and views and to our audience as well for your engagement and questions. I hope the event has been really useful and interesting for everyone watching. Thanks again to our sponsors, Campbell Reith and Taurus. If you enjoyed the networking and want to give it another go, um, please do just bob out and you can um, double click on the tables and start meeting um, your colleagues in this room. Our next and our final Place Northwest Conference of the Year will be Meet the Authorities on 8th of December. You can register for this via our website, placenorthwest.co.uk. Thanks so much again for coming today and we hope to see you all very soon. <laughs>